I don't know if you're paying attention to the news this week, but there was a lot of talk about forgiveness in the news. Did you hear about this? A lot of talk about debt forgiveness. Did you hear about that? So apparently, um, what happened this week was the White House announced, the president announced, that using the authority Congress granted the Department of Education, we will forgive $10,000 in outstanding federal student loans. That was only for people who made less than $125,000 a year. If you had a Pell Grant, you could get up to $20,000 back. The point is, um, someone said, I'm going to have everyone be forgiven of this debt. Now, the problem is... uh, they're not forgiven like everyone's going to wipe it away. The problem is the federal government just actually said that you're now going to pay for it. So every taxpayer will probably pay between two and $4,000 extra if we were to pay it off in a year to pay off all that because the total payment was like $240 billion to forgive people up to $10,000 of student loan debt. So it was a crazy high amount of money. Obviously, you couldn't pay it off yourself. I mean, you couldn't pay two hundred and forty billion dollars. I think people probably could pay ten thousand dollars off at some point if they work hard. But the point is uh, there was like this big thing that happened that really related to what we talk about all the time at church. It, It relates to debt and forgiveness. And we sometimes use those words. But what I want you to know is actually what we're about to study today in the book of Ephesians is a lot better than that because um, no one volunteered to step up and pay off student loans this week. It would have been different, perhaps, if Elon Musk stood up and said, I'm going to use all of my personal wealth to pay off this debt. What they, all they did was just kind of transfer the debt over to you, even though you didn't take out the loans, so that you could pay off people who did take out loans. That's all that really happened this week. Sorry to tell you. Um, kind of stinks for all of you. But the point is, uh, it, we would have been different if someone paid it off themselves. If someone stood up and said, I'm going to use all that I have to pay off this big debt. Well, I hope you know that the Bible says that we have a debt. And it's a debt that's too big for any of us to pay off. It's not $10,000. It's not $20,000. It's not $240 billion. The debt that we owe is to our maker because we fall so short of what he expects from us. That debt is related to a concept we talk about a lot at church, the concept of sin. Sometimes we say sin is when we don't measure up to God's standard. Or sometimes we call sin um, when we break God's rules. We call it a lot of different things. And the, the point is when we sin, what we're doing with God is we're not doing what's expected to God. We fall short and thus there's a debt that starts to accrue. And each and every one of us, depending on how you live your life, you will accrue more and more sin debt as you keep living your life and as people continue to do what is not okay, what's not pleasing to God. That's called the sin debt. But the good news of the Bible is that God did something to actually pay that sin debt, not to transfer the debt of others to the rest of us, but to actually in one single act, the Bible says, Jesus steps up to pay the sin debt that you and I could not pay down ourselves. Jesus did that, and that's the center of everything we study at church, and it's the center of what we're going to study this morning. That concept of Jesus coming in and buying us back, the Bible uses a word called redemption. That's a financial word. It means to be bought back. Specifically, it's usually used to talk about people who are slaves, people who are indebted. Oftentimes in the ancient world, slaves were people who just owed a lot of people money. And because they owed someone so much money and they couldn't pay it off, the way they would pay it off is they'd say, I'll be your slave for X amount of years, and they would do that. But that debt was being paid off. Now, if someone stepped up and said, I'm going to buy this person back, there would be the word redemption. And that's the word that Paul uses to talk about our life before God. Jesus comes along and he redeems us. If you're a Christian, what that means is you have been bought back by Jesus himself. So I want to look at that together. Open up a Bible to Ephesians chapter 1 where it explains all of this to us. Today's another text that that gets into some pretty deep doctrine, pretty deep teaching. It's not just as simple to say Jesus died for your sins, although that is true. This text will explain different facets of what that means. And hopefully, as you walk away from this, you will start to understand better the price that Jesus paid for you and the implications that should have for you. If you're a person who's been redeemed out of a helpless situation, you now have new loyalties. You have now a lot of obligations as someone who's been bought back to the one who bought you back. And that's Jesus himself. Now, Ephesians is starting to talk about all this stuff that God did to save people. Now, we use the word save and salvation and redemption and forgiveness. And to a lot of you, it doesn't really mean anything. Those words are just like a bunch of synonyms in your mind to talk about God stuff, okay? 
I want you to leave today knowing what each one of these words, redemption, forgiveness, I want you to leave knowing what they mean and understanding how important they are, okay? So Paul says in verse three, we already talked about this, but it's the start of this section. It says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We already talked about that last week, but today we're gonna talk about another one of those spiritual blessings that God has blessed us with. One that we oftentimes don't think about, but we need to think about it more often. Drop down to verse number six. It says, all these things happened. Last time we talked about how God chose us and he adopted us, all to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, which means one who is loved by God. Now that you're associated with Christ, if you're a Christian, now you get the blessings that Jesus deserves. That's the point. Now look at verse seven, the start of our text today. It says, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, okay? That concept is all throughout the Bible. Redemption through the blood of someone else. If someone has to step up and die for you, then what's the price, so to speak, that's over your head? What do you owe to God? What's the wages of what you have done? What do you deserve? If you know the Bible, you know that it talks about that all the time. Romans 3.23, or Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Like what's the correct payment for someone who's broken God's rules and lived a life of rebellion against God? Well, the Bible is so clear from Genesis 3 all the way through the end of the Bible that the wages of sin is death. So what do we owe God? Well, we owe God death. So what that means is if all of us got what we deserved based on what we've done, what would we get? What would God have us pay? Well, with our life and death. And now the problem is our lives are so finite that we actually can't even pay God back just by dying or suffering, which is why the Bible describes separation from God or punishment as an eternal death. That's how long it takes to pay God back, so to speak. The point is he never could. That's a hopeless situation. But this text says Jesus, in what he did through his blood, he can buy you back. It's that valuable. He goes on, says, in him, we have redemption through his blood, which is this, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Forgiveness means to let it go, right? It means to drop it. And that's similar to the idea for these people who you know, are getting their student loans forgiven. They're not paying anymore, right? It's off their plate. The problem is it's on someone else's plate now. And that's the same idea with Jesus. Our sins go off of our plate, so to speak. They go off of our spreadsheet where we gotta pay all this debt and they go on someone else's. Right? Whose do they transfer to? Well, this text says it's Jesus who they transfer to. That is the center of everything Christians believe, that our sins can be put on Christ, that when he died on the cross, that he didn't just die as an example, but he died to pay for your sins, for your lying, for your cheating, for your stealing, for your lust, for your pride. Jesus paid a penalty. That's redemption. So that you could be forgiven, which means so that you don't have to pay anymore so that you and God can come back into a right relationship, even though you and God didn't start out in a right relationship. That's what this is talking about. He says, all this happened, look at verse seven, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. The word lavished means to superabound. The idea is, it's like, imagine God takes his grace and his grace is bigger than the sin debt that's there. So like he dumps grace, so to speak. Imagine I got a big bucket full of ice water, right? You remember the ice bucket challenge a long time ago, right? Um, and it just gets dumped on you and you're like, man, that's a lot of ice. Like that, that's, that's cold water and it's dumped on me and it's everywhere and there's nowhere I could hide because it got dumped all over me and I'm covered in it. That's the word lavished. So this is what it's saying. We're redeemed and forgiven through the blood of Jesus according to the riches of his grace, which he dumped on us. God gave us so much grace, not a little bit, not enough grace so that we could earn our way. No, he covered us in grace. That's what it's talking about. Look at verse eight. It says, he lavished us, lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. So now Christians have something, not just forgiveness. Now we have this wisdom and insight to understand what's going on. Look at verse nine. It says, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. What he's saying there is, not only did God do this, but God also explained what he was doing and let you in on the biggest secret in the universe. That's what the word mystery means. Mystery does not mean something that you can't understand. 
In the Bible, the word mystery means something that was hidden, that was secret, that you couldn't find out, that now has been revealed, right? It's like last uh, Wednesday. Remember we were talking about the Brodies, how they're having a baby, right? Remember we talked about that? And to me, it was a mystery what that little girl's name was going to be. Didn't know. I didn't know it. It was a secret. It was just them. But now that mystery has been revealed. Now we all know, right? Hannah, right? Okay, there you go. Uh, Hannah. Um, So that used to be a mystery, and it still is kind of a mystery, but it's now been revealed. What this is saying is, in what Jesus did, he showed you the big plan for the universe, what everything is all about, the purpose of everything. People look for purpose. People try to understand what the world is for, or they try to understand why they exist. This is saying, when Jesus died on the cross, he showed you the purpose of everything, the reason you exist. He let you in on the secret. It would have been true before without you knowing about it, but still now he's shown you. Look at what it keeps saying. Verse number 10 says, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Okay. I want this truth to blow your mind a little bit, but when we understand what Jesus did on the cross, what he was doing was he was taking everything that was broken and wrong and he's putting it back together. Now, that might seem like a stretch, but here's what he's saying. When Jesus dies on the cross, what he's doing is he's going to unite all things to himself, things in heaven and things on earth, right? Whether it be things that you can see or things that you can't see. When Jesus died on the cross, what he's doing is he's securing eternal life for his people and the new world that he's going to create. The things that you don't like about this world, the things that are broken and wrong. Do you understand that in the cross, what Jesus is doing is he's, he's fixing these problems. And you might say the problems are still there. That's true. Because what he did was in the cross, he, he fixed these problems, but he's going to enact those fixings, so to speak. If it doesn't make sense, remember what Jesus did when he walked on earth. What did he do? He taught, he preached, but you know that other thing he did? He healed, right? He healed. Why did he heal people? Right? Was it just to get people's attention? Uh, partly. But I think the big reason why he did that is he's showing you what he's going to do. He's like previewing you to you the redemption that he has. Do you understand that one day God is going to take the history of the world, every nation, every person, all the history of everything, every art, literature, science, all that, and he's going to unite it all in Christ, and the world will be all about Jesus again. That's what he's saying. He's starting that process. When he died on the cross, he's starting that process. And when you become a Christian, what's happening is Jesus is gaining ground and he's reclaiming the world that's his. I know that might sound weird and cosmic and big, but that is the purpose of everything. Our lives are just little parts of that, which is why our lives should be all about this. Look at verse 11. It says, in him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Everything that has happened is all a part of God's big plan that through the sinfulness of humanity and through the redemption that's in Jesus, he paints a glorious big picture. Verse 12, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. What that's not saying is so that we who trust in Christ will praise him. It's not saying that, although that's true. He's not saying so that now we'll praise God. No, he says that we are to the praise of his glory. Like Our salvation, the fact that we were living in sin and now God saved us, that act, that thing, that miracle of regeneration, the Bible says, that is all to the praise of his glory. Like your life is an object of praise to God. That's what he's saying. Now, when he says the first to hope in Christ, I think what he's talking about is this first generation of Jewish people because he's constantly going to go back and forth in the book of Ephesians about um, we and you, we and you. So he's talking about two different groups, but what's the point? Christians, now, if we start to understand what our purpose is, the whole reason you and I exist is to show God's glory. The whole reason you exist and the reason you're saved behind all the benefits that you get, what's the big picture? If we're to zoom out as far as we can, it's all about this. God making a plan to glorify himself. And when Jesus dies on the cross, at that center point of history, what he's doing is he's starting to reclaim everything for himself. Every art, science, literature, everything that's beautiful, everything that's good. In the cross, what he's doing is he's starting to reclaim all of it because those of us who are redeemed in him are gonna live in a new world where it's all directly under the headship, lordship of Jesus. That's actually what the word to unite all things means. It means that everything comes under the head of Christ, which is where it belongs. Now, if you're confused, 
It's because that's a little bit of a confusing concept, okay? If you're confused, that's okay. I was confused a little bit at the beginning of the week, okay? Um, hopefully, I'm not confused now. I'm trying to explain as best I can. But I got three points today to hopefully help explain this the best we can. We need to understand a lot of things. That's why if you look on your worksheet, you got three points that all say understand, okay? If you're going to appreciate God's grace, if you're going to understand this, um, we got to start talking about these things one by one. So the first thing is redemption and forgiveness from verse number seven. I'd love for you to write this down for point number one. Understand your need for redemption and forgiveness. Understand your need for redemption and forgiveness. As you're writing that down, I want you to recall, if you can, to your Sunday school days, um, if you remember the story of Gomer. The word Gomer, ring a bell. Raise your hand if you know who Gomer is. Yeah, see, not, not a very well-known person in the Bible. Like I said, um, if you know who David is, raise your hand. A lot of people would raise their hand, right? If you know who Moses is, okay, Gomer. She's not as popular, okay? Here's the story of Gomer. Uh, Gomer was a prostitute, okay? Um, Gomer was a sex slave, actually. And she's a prominent character in a, in a specific book of the Bible because what happens is um, she was told to marry a guy named Hosea. And actually, Hosea was told to marry her. Hosea was a prophet. He was a good, godly guy. And God says, go marry this lady, and she will not be faithful to you. She won't be faithful to you. She'll try, and you'll have kids, and you, you won't even know if they're your kids. I mean, they might be your kids, but by the time you start to realize it, kids don't look like you. The kids won't even be yours. So ha have fun in that, that situation where you're married to a lady who's unfaithful to you, who has kids that aren't yours, um, not just that she had them before, like when they're married, they had kids and they were not Hosea's, okay? So she's cheating on him. Um, and she runs off, and she goes back into her old line of work. In Hosea 3, God told Hosea, go, gather all the stuff you have, bring all your money, and go buy her back. Go redeem her. That's a picture that God uses there to show, that's what I'm doing to Israel, my people. They were mine. They belonged to me, but they ran away into their sin. Here's what I have to do. I have to go buy them back. That's a picture in the Old Testament to describe Israel. It's also a helpful picture for us to understand our redemption. That every last person in this room has run from God. You might not think you run from God, but every last person runs from God. Some of you are running from God right now. And you're right in the middle of your chasing after whatever you want that's sinful. And here's what it says. God's going to go buy those people back. Redemption means to pay a price to buy someone back. They belonged to God in the first place. We belong to God in the first place. And he owns us twice over because he created us, and then he redeems us, so we belong to him again. That's the picture of redemption. So Hosea took all of his money. He went and he bought his wife back. You don't have to buy your wife back, right? Do you? That seems weird. She's your wife. Why would you have to? Well, because she went out, and she kept pursuing sinful things. So he buys her back. You need redemption. You might not think that you're as bad as Gomer, most of you aren't. I don't think so. Um, she's a pretty bad lady in the Bible. But you need redemption just as much as she does. Um, if you've sinned, if you've broken God's rules like I have, um, then you need redemption. I need redemption. I, I haven't lived up to God's standard. I, I need someone to, to, to come in and fix that problem. You need redemption too. I quoted this earlier, but Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. So if you've sinned, here's the wages, death. Hebrews 9, 22, if you were here last year in True North, Pastor Rod preached on this, uh, the book of Hebrews. But what it says is, uh, Hebrews 9, 22, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Okay? Because in the Old Testament, that was the picture of how bad sin was. If you sinned, something had to die in your place. Because that's what you deserved. Something had to die. That was a picture in the Old Testament, but the reality is every last one of us, um, when we sin, some, something needs to die, right? Either us or Christ, and that, that's the point. There was a ransom paid for your life. The New Testament talks like this. I'd love for you to write this down. 1 Peter 1.18. 1 Peter 1.18, here's what it says. Knowing that you were ransomed. Ransom means a, to pay a large payment to set you free. Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. If you think that the blood thing is all mystical, what this is not saying is every drop of blood for Jesus contains some miraculous power, right? That's not what he's saying. Blood is just a shorthand way of saying life. 
The Old Testament says the life is in the blood. So it's just a way of saying a life has to be given, right? Which is odd for us if you start thinking about life and death and like what does it actually mean for a life to go out of something? It's very strange, right? Um, because it's not supposed to be that way because the wages of sin is death. But when Jesus dies, it says his life is given in replacement for yours. That's the only payment that would satisfy the debt that we deserve. The redemption comes through the blood of Christ. It's an odd concept to us, but it's an important biblical one. But the other thing is you need forgiveness from your trespasses. And those two things are connected, but those are kind of the two things. You need redemption, like the passages we just talked about, but you also need forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Forgiveness means to let go of. You need all the stuff that you've done, right? All your sin, all the sins that people know about and all the sins that people don't know about. All the sins that you've committed in your past, all the sins that you're going to commit in your future. You need that if you're going to have a relationship with God. If you're going to come up underneath the headship of Jesus, you need those sins to be taken off your account. You need them to be let go of. Okay? That's what we all need. We're all guilty. Right? For some of you who are new to all this and maybe you've not understood this before, you have understood this, that when you do things that are bad, you feel bad. There's a, a pit in your stomach and maybe you've never understood why. The reason why is God made you God gave you a conscience, which means you know right from wrong, and when you break your conscience and you do what's wrong, it continues to move along with you and, and get worse and worse, of course, but you're like, I know something has to be dealt with. Like, what I did, that's why a lot of people like will bring their sins out to, to the open and say, I'll pay for it, I'll pay for it. I stole something, but, but I feel so bad and I'll pay for it, right? Even if you don't you know, step up and say, I'm going to pay for something I stole. Um, the reality is all of our sin and all of our guilt, it's on us and it cannot be taken away except through Jesus. He's the only one that can take your guilt away. Right? A lot of you live in shame. Maybe you feel like you've done things that are shameful and that nobody can know about. Okay, that shame gets removed when you trust in Christ. It's off your account. And what this is saying is Jesus can do that. He can take your sin on himself, and you don't have to feel that shame and regret and, and that stuff anymore. It's gone. First Peter 2.24 says, he himself, that's Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Romans 3, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Paul goes on. This is one of the best passages in all the Bible. Romans 3, 23 to 26. It says, we all sin, we fall short of the glory of God, and as Christians, we're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. Like, he's a sacrifice on our behalf. God puts Jesus forward. Jesus willingly volunteers. He dies. He takes our sin on himself, and it's meant to be received by faith through us. This was to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance. That means patience. He had passed over former sins. Think about this. If God wanted to, what he could do is every time someone sins, he could enact that judgment immediately. But what this text says, God holds back. He waits. He doesn't punish right away, which is why some of you think that you're not in trouble with God just because your life hasn't been screwed up yet. Like You understand the whole point is like God's holding back. He's waiting. He doesn't punish right away right? It's not some system of karma where immediately some bad thing happens to you, okay? There's a personal agent involved in whatever punishment is in this world, right? God holds that back in his divine forbearance. He passed over former sins, and it was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just, the righteous judge, and the justifier. Here's what it means. God is not only the judge, he's also the savior. Jesus steps up. He's the only one that can pay your sin debt, and he's our savior while God is still the judge. It's, it's perfect. It's the only way it could have worked. It's the only way that you could not go to hell. It's the only way. Is if God remains God, remains just, punishes all of your sin, every last one of them. And God takes the punishment of sin. That's Jesus. As the perfect system, it could not work any other way. It's amazing. The Old Testament talks about forgiveness a lot. And it uses phrases and concepts that are helpful for us to think about. I want you to write down two passages real quick. Micah 7, 18 and 19. Micah writes about God's forgiveness. And here's what he says. This is what it's like when God lets go of sin. He says, who's a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the rem remnant of his inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. 
He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Right? Here's what God does with our sins. When he punishes them in Christ, there's no other judgment left for them. He takes them, he crumples them up, and he steps on them, and he throws it in the heart of the sea, and they're gone. Which is why if you're a Christian, if you're forgiven, all the sins that you've committed, they are dealt with. They're gone. They're gone. They've been forgiven. Let go. Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those in Christ. There's no judgment day in the sense that you will be punished for all your sins if you're in Christ. But, but that's the only safe place. If you're not in Christ, then, then there is a judgment day because God is just. That tension can only be satisfied in Christ. Psalm 103, 12 Psalm 103, 12 says, as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. When a person is forgiven, you are completely separated from your former sin. All the guilt, all the shame, you're separated from it. You're not supposed to bear it any longer. If you're a person who's been forgiven, you're forgiven. That's the point. He doesn't say the east of the, of the known world in the west, east and west, you like, you might say, oh, well, east and west meet at some point. No, they don't. You keep running east. Keep running east. East and west, they're, they're opposite directions. They never touch. They never meet. He removes it that far from us. Colossians 1 says that God has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints of light. Okay? We're unqualified. What does God do? He qualifies us. He makes us ready, able to receive this. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of our sins. Redemption, forgiveness of sins, they go together. You have to have them in Jesus or you can't have them at all. If you try to earn them on your own, you can't. It's just only in Jesus. You need those things though. Point number one, understand your need for forgiveness. Um, he's the only redeemer. Now, if Jesus does redeem something or someone, what does that mean? Well, it, it means that we belong to him in the first place, which we'll talk about in a second. And now he's just claiming us back. He's getting us back to himself. He was the rightful owner, but he's paying a massive fine to get us back. Verses 8 through 10 in Ephesians 1 talk about how God lavished his grace on us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, the secret plan from of old. That's according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. And here's the secret plan. A plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. That was a secret thing that if you lived in Isaiah's day, you could only know a little bit. That's the secret thing that, you know, in Moses' time, you were only starting to see a little bit of. But now you, sitting in this chair, 120 West in Lisa Viejo, as a high school student, you can know the mystery, the, the, the full thing, why this world exists and where it's going. You can know, and this is what the te text is talking about, that God is uniting all things under Christ. Point number two, once you write this down, if you're going to appreciate God's grace, you need to understand Christ's work to reclaim everything. Understand Christ's work to reclaim everything. It was his in the first place. He's reclaiming it. Um, to some of us, that concept of Jesus claiming us or owning us sounds odd and weird and, and, and backwards. Um, here's kind of what it's like. If after the service today, you went to the nursery, you went to the infants, and you grabbed um, Eden, and you took her, and you put her in your car, and you drove home, and um, I don't know, maybe you went to the park or the beach or, you know, did something super fun with her, maybe you traveled out of town, maybe you crossed state lines, um, I don't know. It, if you did something like that, um, notice the crossing state lines, uh, y you might think you're doing a, a nice, fun thing, but you're, you're kidnapping, Right? Think about what I said. If after the service, you went, you grabbed my daughter, and you just, like, put her in your car, put her in the car seat, like, you just need a car seat. Just put her right there in the passenger seat, front seat of your car, right? And you just took her, right? And you just went, and you, you did your thing, and you went to the beach today, and you're like, oh, we had so much fun. Like, okay, if you did that, that's called kidnapping. We'll call the police and be like, who took our kid? Someone took her. Like, that would be really scary and bad, right? Um, why? Why is that scary and bad? But I can do the same thing. Why can I take Eden, put her in my car, go to the beach, do that? Why can I do that and you can't do that? Right? Well, because she's my kid, right? She's not your kid. If you did it, that's kidnapping. If I do it, I'm, I'm just taking my daughter to the beach, right? 
here's the concept. Um, you belong to Jesus, whether you're a Christian or not. Right? Some of you think, I'm not a Christian, I'll have to listen to you. No, you are God's creation. You belong to him. You're just running away from him. If he reclaims you, that's fine because he has every right to do it. Right? Others of you have been redeemed. You know I belong to God, and now your life is all about serving and honoring him. Okay? You understand that concept. But some of you think, well, because I'm not a Christian, this doesn't matter. You know, when people say things like, you know, I'm not a Christian, so I don't have to follow the Bible's rules. It's like, okay, you just don't understand. God still made you. You still belong to God, right? All that you're doing is you're running from God and you're storing up God's wrath that has to be dealt with in some way, either in Christ or you have to bear it yourself. That's what's going on here. Jesus owns everything. He owns you. Here's what I mean. I want to think through the Bible real quick and what it talks about this. Uh, in the beginning, when God made the world, Genesis 1.31 says that when he made the world, he says, this is very good, right? Before sin entered the world, before there was any uh, crime, before there was any kidnapping, before there was any of that bad stuff, he says, it's good. The world I made, the people I made, the nature I made, it's all amazing. It's good. Uh, immediately after that, what happens is Adam and Eve choose to do what's wrong. They choose to sin. And then what God says is, this world now will be cursed, there will be disease. There will be sickness. Your work will be hard. It even says to, to Eve, even having kids will be hard. All the stuff that would have been easy and good and nice, now it's going to be terrible and hard. My goodness is still going to be there, but the world is cursed now. People like to use the word broken. It's a helpful description. Our world is broken. Why are things not the way they should be? Well, because of sin. Did it start out that way? No, but now there's sin in the world. You know, right there at the very beginning, you know what God started to promise? He made a promise. He said, I'm going to fix it, though. I'm going to fix it. Genesis 3.15, here's what God says. I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, mankind, and between your offspring and her offspring. There's going to be someone that comes from the line of Eve who will fight Satan, is what it says, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. There's going to be like this battle that takes place, and God says, I'm going to fix the problem. Okay, so how long has this plan of Christ been in effect? Since before the foundation of the world. Right? Now, if you were just reading Genesis and didn't have any other book, you'd be thinking, this is a mystery. How is he going to do it? Right? And the Bible continues to talk about it. By the time you get to the book of Isaiah, hundreds of years later, Isaiah says things like this. Speaking for God, God says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they're like a stain, they're like something that is imprinted on your conscience, and you can't forget about it. You can't forget about what you did. You remember it all the time, and it's just living there, the shame. It's like scarlet. It says, they shall be white as snow. I'm going to change it. I'm going to fix it. Though they're red like crimson, they shall become like wool. So God's saying, hey, you know your sin problem? I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix it. A couple hundred years later, God has this book of Daniel come to us. Daniel writes in Daniel 2.44, he says, In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. So while the world has all of its things, God is going to come in and he's going to set up his kingdom. Because guess what? He was the king from the beginning anyway. He's going to replace all this messed up stuff that's in the world. He's going to replace it with his own new version of all of it. He says, he'll set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another person. It's not like he's going to die and say, okay, you're going to rule after I'm gone. No, he'll always be there. And this kingdom will break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to an end. And that kingdom shall stand forever. Okay? So now we're starting to see more of what God promises. You get to the New Testament and to what Paul writes here in Ephesians and even in the book of Colossians. Listen to what he writes in Colossians 1, 16. It says, for by Jesus, by him, all things were created in the beginning whether in heaven or on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So this is the purpose of everything, that Jesus made everything and he made it for him. But is the world living for him right now? No, it's not, right? So what does it say? What's gonna happen next? It says, and he, Jesus, is before all things and in him all things hold together. So he's still the king, and the reason you, whether you're a Christian or not, the reason you still breathe, the reason you still have blood pumping through your veins is because Jesus is upholding the world right now. He's holding you together. The moment he decides not to, you're done. Jesus is still ruling the whole world is what it says. He goes on. He says, and Jesus is the head of the body, the church, and he's the beginning, 
He's the firstborn from the dead. He's the first person that experienced this resurrection and new life when he rose again and lived forever. It says that in him, he might be preeminent in everything. Verse 19, this is Colossians 1, 19. It says, for in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to himself. It's the same thing as Ephesians. Like, what's the point of everything? The point of everything is God made this world. It's going in the wrong direction and Jesus is coming along to bring it back underneath his authority. He's not gonna throw it away and start over. He's gonna reclaim and remake this world. And he's doing it one person at a time. When you bow the knee to Christ and you say, I'm going to serve God for the rest of my life. I'm a Christian now. I'm trusting in Christ. Then God is reconciling things to himself, including you. Little by little, one by one. What's the end of all these things? Well, Romans 8 talks about how one day God will take everything, whether it's nature, whether it's you, your thoughts, emotions, feelings, your body that's broken, your body that feels sick and tired. And, you know, talk to an old person if you want to know about feeling sick and tired. Right? They'll tell you, like, oh, they don't feel good. Talk to your parents, right? Here's what Romans 8 says. It says, not only the creation, but we ourselves who are the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we eagerly await adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Here's what God's going to do next. In this new world, you will live forever, and you're going to have a new body that can never get sick. That's, the Bible actually says, it's not going to be ugly anymore. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be more beautiful than you are right now. So if you think you're ugly, well, just wait a little bit because you're going to be prettier, right? If, if you think you're not good looking, guys, well, sorry. It's, it's coming, right? It's going to be better. You're going to be powerful, you're going to be strong. You're never going to get sick. You're never going to feel bad. It's all going to be perfect, and he's going to redeem your bodies. That's what's coming next. And at the very end, Revelation 21.3 says, I heard a loud voice from the throne of heaven saying this, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. That was the point all along, that God and you would live in harmony with one another. It says, and he will dwell with them again as their people, and God himself will be with them as their God. And it says, he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. They're gone. They're dead. They're over. Because Jesus brings everything together. Now, you might say, well, what if I choose to not embrace him? Well, it's funny you say that because Ephesians talks about how we are to the praise of his glory, those of us who trust in Christ. So there is a human element to this. We have to respond to what he's doing. Right? If you're in Christ, God's going to make you respond. You will respond, right? Willingly, humbly, you're going to do it if you're in Christ. But he says in Philippians 2 that God has highly exalted Jesus. He's given him the name that's above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, not just the Christians. I hope you understand that there will come a day where every last created thing will bow the knee to Jesus and say, you are Lord Jesus. Every atheist, every Muslim, every Mormon, every person who belongs to a different world religion, every agnostic, every person who never goes to church, doesn't care. One day, everyone will bow the knee to Jesus. That's where it says to unite all things in him. That doesn't mean that every last person is going to be saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. It's clear that that's not the point. But how does God unite everything and put it all underneath his lordship? All those who embrace him by faith are his redeemed special people. But all those who push him aside, guess what? Your knee will still bow to Jesus. So if you think that you're like going to get away with this by not bowing to Jesus, the, the problem is like you're going to in the end. You have to submit to Jesus, either in salvation or in judgment. He says, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, whether in heaven or on earth or even under the earth, which is a helpful picture. We talk about people who didn't embrace Christ. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's a special phrase here that you probably skip over most of the time, but it's key to the book of Ephesians. All of that happens to the glory of God the Father. The point of everything is that God is glorifying himself and he's got this master plan where sin and sickness and death is all weaved through, but he's gonna bring it to completion for those of us who trust in Christ and he's gonna fix the problem. He's gonna reclaim everything. I know that's big and cosmic and that might sound confusing, but that's what he's talking about here. <laughs> Think about this. If you understand this, you know the point of everything. The world is so lost about it, they don't know. I mean, I mean listen to what they say. They say, you're just, you know, living on a ball of dirt, so to speak, right? 
the, the point of life is not just to have a good time. The point of life is not just to enjoy all good, God's good gifts, although that's good. Um, the point of life is to glorify God. That's the ultimate purpose. And I hate to break it to you, for those of you who, who don't want to glorify God, you will glorify God in the end. Every last person will. Whether through being a redeemed, humble worshiper of God or through what the Bible calls a vessel of God's wrath. If that's how God has to get glory out of you, then, then he will. But, but the invitation right now for every last one of you is that doesn't have to happen. You can trust in Christ. You can turn from your sin, which is why we say as Christians, we want to turn from our sin now. We got no business living in sin. If that's the whole thing Jesus is redeeming us out of, we got no business being liars. We got no business following your sexual lust. We got no business being people who are proud and air. We got no business in any of that sin anymore. We shouldn't be there because in Christ, he's, he's redeeming us from all that. That's why in Ephesians 1, 11 and 12, the last point here, he says, in him, we've obtained an inheritance and he's done all this so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Like the people themselves are an object of God's praise. Like they're gonna be a, a trophy or a vase that gets put up in God's house and everyone looks at them and says, wow, look at God's grace. Look what they did. Look, look at how God saved that person. Look at how God redeemed them. That person was an enemy of God. Look how God did that. And now not just you are praising God, but everyone who sees your life starts to glorify God for what God did in you, right? That's a concept Jesus talks a lot about. Matthew 5, he talks about people seeing your good works and glorifying the Father. It's the same concept. That when God shows people grace, we get set up, so to speak, to be objects of God's grace where people look at it and, and glorify God even more. It's an amazing plan. It's an amazing purpose. Um, and it's a purpose that if you're a Christian, you, you need to live to. Point number three, I want you to understand your purpose to glorify God. Understand your purpose to glorify God. Um, people look for purpose. Um, they think they're going to find it in their work or their family, their career. Um, I just wish that you could talk to people who spent their whole life searching for their purpose in that, and they come to the end and say, empty, vanity, nothing. Um, it wasn't there. Your purpose is in glorifying God. So whether you are a mechanic or you're a teacher or you're a professional athlete or whatever you do, it does, like your status is I'm here to glorify God in whatever I do. With whatever talents, gifts, relationships God gives me, I'm going to glorify God through it. That's, that's what Christianity is all about in the end. Those who are redeemed belong to God twice over. So we should give him twice as much glory. That's why the New Testament says that whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you should do everything for the glory of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10.31. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. In that context was people making these arguments about what kind of foods they should eat. Should we allow, are we allowed to eat these foods? Here's, here's what Paul says. Just do everything for God's glory, right? W whatever's not sinful, you can do for God's glory, right? You can go to work at Chick-fil-A. I mean, that's, that's God's work too a little bit, right? Um, they count that as ministry. Uh, is that sir? No, um, I'm just kidding, sorry. Uh, you can go there and you can serve God, right? You can serve God at school when you do your calculus homework and you don't like it. And you don't understand logs, right? Does that mean anything to you, logs? Ah, there you go. Um, you can do your geometry proofs, right? Oh, you didn't want it to hit home, right? Your, your geometry proofs. You write your essays on Macbeth. Oh. <laughs> You can read Romeo and Juliet in front of the class for God's glory. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The concept of Jesus reclaiming everything should make a difference for you. If you're a Christian, what it means is, if you have emotions or thoughts that are out of line with God's will, what are you supposed to do? Bring those back under the authority of Christ. If you've got actions and patterns and behaviors that are sinful, that are not in keeping with what God would want you to do, what do you do? Bring them back under the headship of Christ. Right? If you've got attitudes and, and things about you where you might be doing you know, good stuff at church and you might be serving and you might be you know, even evangelizing to people, but if you've got a bad heart, what are you supposed to do? Bring all that back underneath the lordship of Christ. Like, he's the head. Everything has to come underneath what he wants. That's why 
for those of you who have to make life decisions and college decisions and job decisions and relationship decisions and boyfriend and girlfriend decisions and all that stuff, okay, here's the point. Just do everything as Christ would want you. That's, okay, that sounds a little complex, but that, that's the whole point. Glorify God. What does it mean? That you and your decisions, you say, what's most glorifying to God? Is me being friends with this person most glorifying to God? Great, I'll be friends with them. Hey, is me being friends with this person the most glorifying to God? And if the answer is no, well then, I guess I'm not. If me being in this relationship with this boyfriend or this girlfriend, if it is most glorifying to God, do it. Oh, but if it's not most glorifying to God, then, then, then don't. If me pursuing this college is most glorifying to God, then do it. That's awesome. If it's not, though, then don't do it. If you using those words and those adjectives, if that's most glorifying to God, then do it. But if it's not, then don't. That's, that, that's what we're getting to. And that might feel like it's all-encompassing. Wait, wait a minute. Do you mean my whole life has to be about this? I'm not saying your whole life has to be about this. I'm saying everything in the universe has to be about this. Which is why if you're a Christian, you have this battle where it's like you have feelings and emotions and thoughts that don't come alignment with Christ and, and you hate that and you're just always trying to like move back. Do you understand that every thought, emotion, feeling, bodily appetite, everything when you're in the new world will be perfectly aligned under the headship of Christ. There'll be no more battle there. We can just enjoy the life that God has given us and work for his glory for eternity. In the end of everything, the book of Revelation says, this is Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. It says, people sang a new song to the Lamb. That's Jesus. And they said this, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. That's talking about you. That's talking about me. Verse 11 says, Then I looked, and I heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders and the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, and all that is in them, saying, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb, be blessing, and honor, and glory, and might, forever and ever. That's what everything is about. That's what your life is about. That's what my life is about. When you see things that are big and impressive, sometimes we don't appreciate them until we step back and see the whole thing, right? Um, that's why I hope what this sermon is doing today is helping you step back and see what everything is all about. Now, that's a big task. It reminds me, I went to SoFi Stadium uh, where the Rams play, and they have a super impressive screen, right? It's huge. It's like the biggest screen that's ever been made. It's like a 360-degree screen that's right in the middle, and it's got a screen on the inside and a screen on the outside. It weighs like 100,000 million tons or something. Um, I don't know how much it weighs. Um, but I do know this. It is a 70,000 square foot screen. Okay? If you know how big your house is, and now imagine the screen is 70,000 square feet, like your house is probably between 1,000 and 4,000 square feet. Okay? This screen is 70,000 square feet. Do you know how many pixels are in this screen? Get this, 80 million pixels. Honestly, they could have fit some more in there, right? I mean, for such a big screen, 80 million is like, oh, that's not that impressive. Um, but every pixel plays its part, right? Like every pixel does. And if pixels decided not to play their part and not to contribute to what was going on, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look good. Now, the pixels don't all do the same thing, right? You understand that not every pixel, if they want it to all be blue, then I guess they all do the same thing. But... What God's doing in this world is kind of like that. It's a big, grand plan where each and every one of us, as little individual pixels, are just meant to glorify God in whatever way God wants you to do. And what you do might be different than the person next to you. Your job and your relationship and your family, it will be different, but the point is that all the little pixels add up to this big, grand masterpiece that glorifies God. Which is why if your thought is, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do, that's not the answer. Although you might do something different than the person sitting next to you, our job together is to glorify God in our lives with whatever we do. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do everything in the name of Jesus and for his glory.
This is why right now, that would be good for us to end in a song. I want us to sing some praise to God right now. The band's going to come up. I'm going to pray. But I want us to think about the good things that God has done and that I want to, after this, take our, our conversations and our attitudes and all that and say, I'm going to glorify God in all my decisions, big and small. Let's pray to God right now, then we'll sing to him one last song. God, we trust what your word says. We think back to the first sermon and how we need to take the book of Ephesians as truth from you. This is a huge truth that you're uniting all things to yourself. I pray that every last one of us would play our part in the big things that you're doing. Think of some of us who are going to be glorifying you in the church. Some of us are going to be glorifying you at school, homeschool, private school, public school, wherever you have us. I pray that we would be faithful to glorify you in everything because you redeemed us. You bought us back. I pray for those of us in this room who are running away from you, who think that we can live our lives without glorifying you. I pray that you would break us down, that you would cause us to come back, turn to you, repent, and that you would get glory in saving those people. I pray that we would not run from you, but we would willingly come to you and we glorify you in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.